Land Art for the Media Age by Kristen Swinson. A paradigm shifting exhibition reassesses Earth art, offering an unconventional view of the movement's objects, actions, and sites. In March of 1962, John Tingley arrived in Las Vegas to construct a massive autodestructive sculpture study for an end of the world number two. It would perform its ritual suicide in the Nevada desert against the backdrop of dusty brown mountains and before a bank of national news cameras. The Swiss Nouveau realist provocateur was by then notorious for his calamitous machines. His homage to New York had burst into flames in a massive anti-art spectacle in the Museum of Modern Art's Sculpture Garden in 1960. In response, NBC commissioned Tingley to create the new piece in Las Vegas. The sprawling machine, cobbled from junk and painted in primary colors, came to life only to meet a quick death. An easy chair caught fire. Makeshift bombs spewed geysers of dirt into the air. Dynamite blasted a water tank, a shopping cart full of toys, an old air conditioner, and other objects representing the American lifestyle. Tingle's choice of site was important. Massive explosions in the Nevada desert were already nationally televised spectacles, broadcast from the nuclear proving grounds north of Las Vegas. Tingley is not a figure typically associated with land art, yet the 20-minute segment of David Brinkley's journal, projected at mural scale, represented the first work encountered by visitors to ends of the earth, land art, to 1974. The ambitious revisionist show curated by Philip Kaiser, now director of Museum Ludwig in Cologne, and Miwon Kwan, Professor of Art History at the University of California, Los Angeles, which debu debuted at the Geffen Contemporary Branch of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Study for an end of the earth signals the term of this radical curatorial rethinking of land art. Time-based media, whether televised spectacle or artist-made videos, performative acts, small-scale ephemeral artworks, and imagined but unrealized transformations of the landscape are all presented as central forms of the movement, overturning established notions of land art as massive displacements of the Earth's surface. Land art and pop art, the American version was called New Realism in the early 1960s, creating continuity with Tinguely, Yves Klein, and other European Nouveau realists, might seem antithetical to, one, to each other but both responded to mass media, consumerism, and the turbulent geopolitics of the 1960s. The affinity of these contemporaneous movements is also emphasized in the show. As critic David Hickey wrote, of the, in, the pages in 19, wrote in these pages in 1971, they are both arts of location and dislocation, deriving energy from sophisticated forms of trespassing. And perhaps most surprising, the exhibition shows land art to be truly international development, to be a truly international development with significant expressions across Europe, Japan, and South America. If you open most books surveying 20th century art, land art is represented by three entries, all cited in the American West. Michael Heitzer's Double Negative, 1969-70, Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty, 1970, and Walter de Maria's Lightning Field, 1977. The icon iconic physical nature of these earthworks with their massive scale, double negative, two deep trenches in the edge of a mesa, is longer than the Empire State Building is tall. Potential as pilgrimage sites and dramatic metamorphoses of the landscape itself has come to eclipse the heterogeneous experimental practices that proliferated around ideal ideas of land and nature in the 1960s and 70s. Of the American triumvirate, as Demara, Heitzer, and Smithson are designated by their curators, the two living artists, Demaria and Heitzer, are not 
included in the exhibition, although their work is a touchstone. DeMaria's Lightning Field, New York Earth Room, 1977, and other, and other of his best-known works were produced after the show's cut-off date of 1974, by which, the, by which point land art had become a fully congealed art category. And in any case, both DeMaria and Heitzer whose double negative belongs to MOCA's permanent collection despite its location 60 miles north of Las Vegas, declined to participate. They prefer not to show artifacts, documentation, in a gallery, as they believe that only the first-hand experience of the works can convey their and challenging nature. Collector, patron, and dealer Virginia Juan, who has offered critical early support of these artists in the late 1960s, explains in, these, in the ex exhibition catalog. This makes them outliers. As the exhibition amply demonstrates, land art was predicated on all kinds of display and representation. So what is land art, if not additive, spiral jetty and the lightning field, or subtractive double negative modifications to the surface of the earth? Of course, Feats of civil engineering were not within reach of many artists, but the show suggests that such acts were probably not of interest to them. The exhibition portrays land art as a museum and gallery-based phenomenon. It's an odd notion. It wasn't the point to situate artworks in the landscape, but an accurate one. Most often, artists did not have the expectation that viewers would encounter their work in situ. Rather, the majority knew that documentation in film, video, and photography, or through sketches and plans, would be the primary public expression of their practices. And earthworks were also understood as objects or gallery-based installations that evoked land or place through forms of mapping, or the incorporation of elements of nature. Indeed, for years before Smithson embarked on his 19 69 series of rundowns, temporary incursions that involved pouring materials like asphalt, glue, and cement down hills or cliffs. He produced non-sites, indoor works that represent a locale through photographs, maps, and earth or rocks. Important early manifestations of the earth art movement include galleries, gallery and museum shows, and television broadcasts representing such forms of work into the forms of work. End of the Earth highlights a few definite exhibitions. Earthworks at the Duan Gallery in 1968. Earth Art, organized by Will B. Sharp at Cornell University's Andrew Dixon White Museum of Art in 1969. And Land Art, a Gary Shum, <clears throat> a broadcast created for 19, but in 1969 by German filmmaker Gary Shum for his television gallery, shown on a West Berlin public television station. Artists participating in these contexts were group, grouped in the MOCA show, establishing a sense of the original presentations of and dialogues between the works. For the Earth Art Exhibition, Dutch artist Jan Dibbets produced an outdoor intervention, a large V-shaped path over 100 feet long, in the woods several miles from the Cornell Museum. He considered this piece a trace in the wood in the form of an angle of 30 degrees crossing the path to comprise both the walk to the site and the five black and white photographs on view in Earth Heart, also in Ends of the Earth. Of the Earth. An unwieldy construction by Neil Jenny, his last sculpture, Jenny began became well known for his bad painting series in the 1970s. Originally shown in earth art and reconstructed for ends of the earth, consists of poorly assembled shelving units laden with dirt. For his gallery transplants, Dennis Oppenheim drew the floor plan of the galleries of the Andrew Dixon White Museum and the landscape outside, often incising them at full scale in the snow. In doing so, he rejected the permanence and protective aspect of exhibition spaces and further drew attention to the increasingly mediated experience of nature as a framed commercialized entity. 
The Cornell transplants exist now as 40 by 60 inch pieces, each encompassing a photograph of the site, an explanatory text, the architectural floor plan, and a map. What accounts for the interest in land site and environment <clears throat> among a diverse group of artists in the 1960s and 70s? The works presented in Ends of the Earth suggest that artists were invested in a variety of land use issues, including occupation and borderland politics. Allegorio Iboti, Pinches Cohen Gan, Mika Ullman, Nuclear Testing, Tinguli, Ecological Concerns, Andrew Piper and Helen Meyer, Harrison and Newton Harrison and negotiations of the period's rapidly developing urban spaces. Mary Miss, Klaus Oldenburg. Other explore the relationship of humans to the natural world, or use the land as a means of representing topics ranging from feminism to cultural identity. Anna Mendieta, Judy Chicago, Agnes Danis, Mirla Laterman, UK List. And for artists such as Joan Jonas, Sola Witt, and Ed Rusha, the land was a medium for conceptual exercises, detached from any overt political or social import. Imagined displacements and reconfigurations of land were realized through collage, montage, and mapping. The Italian Collective Super Studios 1970-71 collage with photogravu and crayon places a huge cube of forest onto the Golden Gate Bridge. Piper, Isamu, and Noguchi and others drafted fantastical monuments and memorials that respond to specific places. A parallel grid proposal for Dugway Proving Grounds in 1968, Piper reacted to the release of poison gas at a Utah chemical warfare test site by proposing a structure of telephone cables that will alert nearby residents to the facility's activities. She produced 30 pages of maps, diagrams, and text detailing the the idea. The Noguchi made drawings for a huge pyramid topped with a stainless steel plow that would commemorate the history of agriculture in the Midwestern United States, monument to the plow in 1933. Most instances of land art involved non-pictorial engagement with the actual sites, or the use of earth and other materials found in nature. At MOCA, New York-based artist Alan Songfist Attach branches and twigs to the wall of the gallery, copying the exact arrangement in which he found them on the forest floor one day in 1969. Joshua Neustein, a po Polish artist working in Israel and New York, recreated a room-sided installation from 1970 titled Road Piece, in which bales of hay were arranged along strips of tar paper with an audio recording of, of freeway traffic amplified throughout the space. The smell of alfalfa was strong, and the familiar but toxic seeming background noise gave further gave attendees a visceral experience of a pastoral yet polluted environment. Several compelling works situate fragments of nature within the, the confines of the museum. Helen Mayer Harrison and Newton Harrison's Hog Pasture Survival Piece Number no. 1, initially commissioned by the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in 1970-71, consists of strains of gla glass, grass and clover flourishing in a large wooden box under, under grow lights, a meadow that is at once artificial and nostalgic. Conservatories, Guiana, 1969-72, 2000-2012, an approximate 5x5x4 five by five by foot hothouse by German artist Lothar Baumgarten, contains live German kale and topical tropical butterflies. The pairing of species from, a, from distant parts of the world suggests a kind of microcosm of globalization, collapsing the distance between dramatically distinct cultures and ecosystems. There, was, there were small sculptural evocations of Earth, including the <coughs> including Noguchi's bronze topographical, topographic form circa 1943, derived from aerial photographs in the North Amer African desert riven from bomb craters, and sculptures made of earth, such as Italian artist Pino Pascali's 
wall bound cubes. 1 MC du Tierra, 2 MC du Tierra, 1967. Composed of 1 cubic meter and 2 cubic meters of soil, respectively. Ephemeral earthworks were documented. Photos and sketches by Nobuo Sekain presented a cylinder of compacted dirt, approximately 9 feet high and 7 feet in diameter, and the hole in the ground from which it was taken as part of an open air sculpture <coughs> exhibition in Kobe, Japan in 1968. The earth was returned to the hole at the end of the Kobe show, leaving no trace of the temporary monumental presence. A, simply note, a simple note by Yves Klein, Ye, Ye Riscau told to Ava surface de Tierra, I will raise everything on the surface of the entire earth, circa 1960, was in the show, along with an international Fine blue mono monochrome region de Grenoble, 1961, whose surface echoes the top topography of the Grenoble region. The latter was a part of Klein's planetary relief series, <coughs> in which he imagined that he was that his signature saturated blue could overcome political boundaries. Charles Ross offered another kind of painting with examples from his solar burn system series. 1972. He concentrated sunlight through prisms to create city painterly burns across painted wood panels. Cultural and political meanings are embedded in the land, and the exhibition contains numerous instances of work that address collective histories and territorial tensions. Czech artist Zorka Sagbova staged fugitive interventions outside Prague in the late 1960s and early 1970s. For homage to Gustav Overman, 1970, Zaglova burned 21 jute and gasoline-filled bags that night in, in memory of a shoemaker who was said to have protested the German occupation of Prague by spitting fire while circum circumambulating the city. In her 1974 performance, Maintain Your Destiny, Michaela's transferred jars of soil from her birthplace in Denver to her current residence in New York City to Jerusalem. She buried them in the Israel Museum Sculpture Garden, in turn removed two jars of Israeli soil to be held as ransom until the return in life or her burial in Israel upon her death. Photographs of the artist on her knees digging the earth with her hands reveal the artist's personal physical engagement with this symbolic act. The desire to get into the land to become immersed by in the earth as a kind of ritualistic performance was enacted by a range of artists. Anna Mendieta's Earth Body Works are probably the best known instances here with feminist over overtones relating to really nature to the female body. Mendieta performed a series of ceremonial burials, covering her body with sod, stones, or wildflowers in a primordial return to the womb. Charles Cinem Simon's film, Landscapes, Body, Dwelling, 1973, shows the artist rising out of a clay pit, his nude body covered in terracotta, representing the birth of a mythic elemental figure. Oppenheim and Vito Acconci undertook dur durational pieces, put pitting their bodies against the land in a futile struggle with the sand. These performances, performative encounters were present through dozens of videos supporting the curator's thesis that land art is a media practice as much as a sculpture form. Indeed, it is easy to forget that a work as iconic as Spiral Jetty was not necessarily intended to be experienced foremost as a physical sculptural presence. Rather, for Smithson, the ep eponymous film made on the occasion of the jetty's construction and her weaving of science fiction, natural history, performance, and documentary was a primary artwork, not merely a repertorial substitute. The film's reproduction and proliferation, as with photographs of the jetty, is a foil to the singularity and remoteness of the earthwork. The spiral jetty film, 1970, was projected in a gallery situated at the center of Geffen's vast floor, serving as an origin point from which other works by Smithson, Nancy Holt, his wife and collaborator, and members of the New York Mellow, to Joan Jonas seemed to issue. Smithson's short essays, The Spiral Jetty, 
a third primary work on the theme was printed across the wall outside the gallery, in which the film was screened. Although the curators intended to broaden and complicate land art, to be clear, Ends of the Earth is not interested in merely representing inside the museum canonic projects. They state, there is no attempt to revisit critical assessments of Smithson or other key figures. The show presents land art as far more inter inter intertwined with museums and galleries than has been acknowledged, appending assumptions that the moment represented a decisive Movement represents a decisive break with the gallery from the gallery system, art world centers, and urban social context generally. As was the case with Oppenheim's gallery transplant series, this institutional engagement could be quite direct and self-reflexive. Los Angeles artist Maria Nordman, who emerged in the late 1960s in the context of Southern California's light and space movement, and set into MoCA's external wall an angular white chamber that opened onto the sidewalk of Alameda Street. The piece was originally executed at the Newport Harbor Art Museum in 1973. Other similar installations by Nordman and European venues, including Documenta exhibitions in 1977 and 80, 82 and 87. No accompanying explanation or label was permitted by the artist. The space was exposed to the elements throughout the show, allowing Dustin free to collect on the pristine white floor. And the chamber's sharp angles functions like an abstract sundial, with shadows re registering the passage of time. Yoko Ono's Sky TV, a closed circuit video work from 1960. Six, screens a live feed of the sky above the museum, another means of confusing boundaries between exhibition space and the world outside. As a whole, the show demonstrates the essentially indefinable character of land art, when understood in an expansive international sense, with artists reflecting diverse regional art histories with socio-political contexts. A gallery dedicated to South American artists included documentation of political actions by Brazilian artist Artur Sub Barrio and Tildo Mireles. So the desire among a critical mass of artists and the developed world to work with the land is a compelling phenomenon, and the ends of the earth recovers the details of a crucial history. The parameters of land art ultimately become unclear, but this is preferable to a looming definition that omits the diversity and complexity with a major tendency in art since the 1960s. While the exhibition ends at 1974, the legacy of land art informs vital contemporary practices, through, though Heitzer refuses to participate in Ends of the Earth. His levitated mass, 2012, was contempor contemporaneously installed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in June to great fanfare. 340-ton granite megalith was excavated from a quarry in nearby Riverside County and transported to Los Angeles, an epic dislocation feat of engineering that maintains the notion of land art as an institutional and urban phenomenon. A series of younger artists and collectives ranging from the Center for Land Use of, of Interpretation to Francis Elise, Trevor Paglin, and Edgar Arkno continue to draw from principles of land art to inform important artworks relevant to a new media age.